Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I guess uh, Charlie is away, so he asked me to fill in. 
so today we have uh, two speakers from the radiobiology and radiotherapy program in the uh, Cancer Center. The first will be uh, Ranjit Bindra, who actually at the last minute has changed the topic of his talk. So those of you who are coming for what was written, I hope you're not disappointed because he's going to talk about uh, exploiting oncometabolite-induced brachiness uh, for cancer therapy. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot for uh, having me today, and I apologize about the last-minute talk change. Uh, we just have a lot of exciting things on the clinical trial front, and uh, uh, with Pat and colleagues, I uh, wanted to kind of share where we are with our clinical trials. They're kind of set to take off on the runway. Um, so here are my disclosures. I won't be talking about anything related to uh, Cybrexa uh, today, um, but moving along, I want to give you sort of uh, an overview of what we'll talk about, and just uh, sort of a note that we're really just going to give uh, translational clinical highlights today. There's going to be a lot more information presented at our radiobiology seminar, which will be uh, October 8th. Okay? So first, we'll start with a review and update on the oncometabolite-induced brachinous discovery that was uh, made here at Yale. A lot of you already know this story, and because of time, we'll just zip through that in a few minutes. And then sort of with a rock and roll analogy, we're going to talk about how we're sort of bringing this from the lab into the clinic. We'll start sort of with a sound check, which is the OLAPCO trial, which will tell you about how we treated IDH mutant patients with PARP inhibitors. Move on to the first set, which will be talking about our uh, early clinical trials network uh, trial that's about to uh, uh, launch. And then the second set, which is our ABTC trial. And if I don't get cut off, we'll do an encore. Uh, we'll talk about our PNOC trial, and we'll just talk about what our future plans are. So let's get started. So um, just a very brief overview of IDH mutant tumors. So uh, as many of you know, this story broke in 2008. This was a, a tour de force sequencing effort. Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler were uh, doing the study whole exome sequencing, and remarkably, they found about 5% of GBMs uh, that there were these uh, very, very peculiar hotspot heterozygous mutations in IDH1 and IDH2. These are involved in the citric acid cycle. They all cluster around uh, R132 and R172, uh, shown here, uh, for IDH2. And subsequently, they, as they looked deeper, uh, other investigators also realized that multiple tumors, subsets of those tumors, all have IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. And of note for uh, the talk today, about 70% of all grade 2 to 3 gliomas uh, have these mutations. So these are heterozygous, as I said before, missense mutations. There was no loss of heterozygosity. Uh, so at the moment, it seemed like when this paper came out, that was sort of a slam dunk. This is an activating oncogene. All right. Turns out not so simple. Okay. And to understand why it's not so simple, we need to understand the function of these mutant uh, uh, proteins. So as all of you remember from medical school, graduate school, college, the citric acid cycle shown here. Uh, so the normal function of isocitrate dehydrogenase is to convert uh, isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. As I mentioned earlier, these are neomorphic mutations as discovered by Agios and uh, Craig Thompson and folks in 2009 uh, that actually take the normal product uh, okay, of wild-type IDH1 and convert it into something that's completely different. <clears throat> uh, this is termed R2-hydroxyglutarate. This leads to two to three millimolar excess of this unknown metabolite to the cell with a relative depletion of alpha-ketoglutarate levels. The, these molecules have been termed oncometabolites. And understand why it's onco, not just metabolite. Uh, we need to delve a little bit deeper, okay? Uh, so here's that pictorial that I showed you earlier. So there's a family of proteins called alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent diogenase proteins, and uh, these are uh, present and have multiple functions in the cell, and they all require alpha-ketoglutarate uh, for function. Shown here, as I mentioned earlier, you have a relative depletion, so you inhibit the function of the protein, but not only that, the 2-HG actually competitively binds and blocks uh, the function of these proteins, uh, and they have in inactivation of about 73 alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent uh, dioxygenase is in the cell, okay? So what do these proteins do? So again, without too much detail, they're all over the place. And we still don't even know how some of these, these proteins function. So it's a very fascinating phenotype. Uh, but just to give you a sense, there's changes in histone methylation, cytosine methylation, hypoxia regulation, many other pathways, TBDs. The pathway I'll tell you about today is the pathway that we discovered uh, in collaboration with Laser Lab and several other people here, that these mutations lead to a brachiness phenotype, okay? But the take-home message for this slide is that these oncometabolites block a diverse family of alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent dioxygenation, and it's probably leading to activating and inhibitory functions, okay? So it's not so simple to call this just an oncogenic driver mutation. So these are neomorphic mutations. How do we categorize them? Um, so if we just call an oncogene, it's easy, right? We just sort of check off the box. We give them sort of an EGFR-like kinase inhibitor, or in this case, we, we inhibit the mutant neomorphic function of the protein, okay? And that's very important because this is the, where the entire IDH field is at its current point, okay? Uh, and just to give you an example, there are companies out there, as Dave will say, 
uh, that have uh, mutant ID inhibitors, beautiful drugs that are really good at turning off 2-HG, okay? Uh, and the idea is that, just to zoom in there, that if we did that, their driver mutation would have a broad, profound impact uh, on uh, anti-tumor uh, uh, phenotype. Now, our perspective, I could probably give a whole grand round on this, and I'd go way over and Peter would be mad, uh, but I won't. I'll just tell you what we think. We think that the mutant IDH1 is really a transformative event in the cell, but once the cell is transformed, it becomes a passenger mutation. Other people have shown that. We firmly believe that such that blocking neomorphic activity will result in nothing more than a scalemate. As we all, we need to checkmate for this disease. Okay? So we would argue the other side of the coin, that there could be tumor suppressor functions of these oncometabolites. And this is much like BRCA1 mutants, as some of you know in the room. Mutant BRCA1 predicts for synthetic lethality with PARP inhibitors, DNA repair inhibitors. And in that manner, we want to try to exploit the defect rather than actually turning <laughs> off uh, the neomorphic function. So I'm just going to give you like one slide of, uh, of all the work that we've done, just because I want to focus on the clinical stuff today. Uh, but what we've shown, uh, and this is really, has been a lot of fun, because it's been collaboration with multiple groups, mainly uh, the Glazer Lab, Stephanie Lee and Brian Shook, who's now at UCLA. Uh, but what we found is that these oncometabolites, 2-HG in both enantiomers, who are in the S form, block a histone demethylase pair called KDM4 A and B. Uh, that leads to suppression model this recombination, and that leads to what we call brachinous phenotype. So PARP inhibitor sensitivity as the main uh, readout and most therapeutically relevant here. We published this about a year uh, and a half ago in Science Translational Medicine. And as many of you know, we recently uh, published that other oncometabolites within the citric acid cycle and cancers that overproduce these metabolites also have a similar bracket as phenotype, and this was just out a few months ago. <clears throat> and uh, the name of these two papers were driven by a single uh, obsessed graduate student, Parker, who may be in the audience, has really been uh, a pleasure to work with him from the Glazer Lab. Obviously, there are many other players uh, that were involved, but he was really the, the main person driving this project. <clears throat> And then finally, uh, through about three other groups shortly after and then over the last year have validated our findings, have shown that uh, oncometabolite-induced PARP sensitivity is a true thing. And so that's uh, increased the significance in, uh, of our work. So where are we going from here? So um, just to sort of give you this map here, uh, we're sort of now going in all different directions. So uh, the Laser Lab is now working on in-depth mechanism of action studies to understand exactly the KDM4A interaction with homologous recombination, because again, that is uh, completely brand new. Uh, we're actually looking at other synthetic lethal actions, uh, interactions using the same platforms that we use in this paper. Uh, and unfortunately, I was going to talk about that today, uh, but if you really want to hear it, you can come to Nate Fonz, one of our first graduate students, uh, who will be uh, defending his thesis on this subject. It's a very, very cool story. In parallel, we've been working in the translational front, looking at combination therapy uh, strategies, combinations of other DNA repair inhibitors and DNA damaging agents, uh, and trying to understand how we can maximize uh, this uh, uh, this potential interaction, and this is really multiple people. But what I'm going to tell you about today, uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes, is really how we're trying to bring this from the lab into the clinic, okay? And, and the one theme here is that it takes a village, right? This is not, not easy. Um, so these are the sort of concepts that we think about. And again, we're going to touch on these at the radiobiology uh, seminar. We have a full hour. Uh, but these are four points that I think anyone that's thinking about moving their stuff from the lab to the clinic, uh, obviously, with beyond talking, <coughs> should think about. So the first, the first question is obviously, will the company play ball? You have the best idea with a drug, the company's not going to call you back, try, try to get off the ground, right? Uh, for our, for our uh, specific scenario, for glioma trials, we need to understand whether our PARP inhibitors are CNS permeable. That's very, very important, okay? Uh, and then on point three, are we confident that the drug in the class that we're going to run in that trial is actually act against the disease? Okay, and we'll actually touch on that in that seminar next month. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, even if you have the best study in the world with the best idea, if you have a biomarker that's quite rare, how are you going to accrue that study in a reasonable period of time? Okay, uh, Really, because of time, we'll just focus on point two, because this is probably the most instructive for, uh, for uh, riding along uh, into the clinic. So I'm going to start first okay, with a story from a year and a half ago, uh, Valentine's Day 2017. I was, I'm sure you all remember this grand round. But, uh, and I presented this case. Uh, this was Brian, uh, was BD, oh my goodness, uh, and uh, patient 17. Uh, this patient was on our phase 01 nevephrodol trial. This was a radio sensitizer trial from a, uh, a study that we ran based on a drug we developed in our laboratory. Uh, and uh, we we're testing uh, the efficacy of nevephrodol as a radio sensitizer in recurrent GBM. Uh, when I presented this about a year and a half ago, uh, some of you may recall, or just show you here, uh, we had, he was an exceptional responder to stereotactic radiosurgery, sixth grade times five with nevephrodol. Uh, and this was the patient that 75% response six weeks out after therapy. Okay, uh, in our trial, that was the most uh, remarkable uh, response case that we'd seen. Uh, unfortunately, this patient actually had a distance out of the radiation field uh, recurrence more anteriorly shown there. 
okay? When this patient actually uh, presented, uh, he actually had then gone to foundation medicine and gotten his tumor sequenced. And he actually came out and said, well, here, here's, our, uh, here's our report. And is there, is there anything here that we can act that's actionable, okay? Uh, and this is important because this is right around the time our paper had just been accepted in science translational medicine. Uh, and importantly, we actually looked back and we said, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if the IDH mutation predict for sensitivity uh, to uh, the radiation that we give them. Obviously, I want to think it's our radio sensitizer, but there could be some tumor genetics at play here. And that probably is indeed the case. We know that IDH mutants, maybe by the HR defect or other pathways, are radio sensitive. But again, as I mentioned, this paper had just come out. Uh, and uh, Olaparib is an FDA-approved PARP inhibitor for BRCA and ovarian cancer. Uh, I'm really working closely with Yoakum and Kevin. Uh, at the time, we asked whether we could get compassionate use uh, from, from for the drug for the patient from AstraZeneca. So that's actually where we left the story. That was like the last slide. I just want to kind of give you the follow-up to what happened with that story because it's very instructive for how we think about uh, clinical trials moving forward. So around that time, we looked and we thought, well, first of all, is Olaparib going to penetrate the CNS, right? If you go in animal models, you'd be pretty bummed out because this is actually an autoradiograph with C14 labeled Olaparib. Okay, and you can see there, that it's getting everywhere except the brain stem and the brain, okay? So at that point, we said, well, there's no animal data supporting this. So we turned to our collaborators, uh, namely Anthony Chalmers, PI of a study called the Operatic trial, which is actually testing Olaparib in the recurrent GBM, IDH wild type. Uh, and this was a great study because he had a phase zero component built in uh, where he gave Olaparib for several days prior to a re-resection then looked by LCMS to see if the drug was in the tumor. <clears throat> so what did he find? So interestingly, he actually found that despite the animal data, uh, at least within the enhancing portion of the tumor, you could detect near micromolar, if not maybe about half a micromolar levels of elaborate, right up actually to the tumor margin, okay? Uh, and, but he wasn't able to, to see this uh, drug penetrate further into the brain, which again is predicted by the animal studies, but not completely with the enhancing tumor component, okay? Um, and so what did we learn? Well, we learned, first of all, that, that just looking at the animals is not going to be the, the whole story, okay? This drug, in, in this case, penetrates enhancing disease, but not non-enhancing disease. I'll show the non-clinicians what non-enhancing disease looks like in a moment. But this also highlights the fact that in almost every trial in the brain, uh, looking in brain tumors, we need to think about phase zero trials because animal data doesn't always predict what you're going to see in tumors. Okay? Uh, so actually, Anthony uh, told me at the time, he's a good friend of mine, said, he's gonna, I'll bet you a beer that you're going to control enhancing disease in this patient, but not so much the flip. Okay? And he's actually going to, we've invited him to give grand rounds December 4th. You can come, I'm buying him a beer then. You guys can come. Uh, and, uh, and, he's, and, and so it turns out he was right. Okay, and so I'll show you this patient's case. Uh, so really, uh, about a few months after grand rounds, we treated him off-label. This was actually his enhancing disease, okay? And this was his response on Olaparib, okay? T1 post-enhancing disease was marked marked response. So the clinician's room was confounded. It had a distant history of Avastin, okay? But this patient should have had a rebound on the T1 post, so I, I'll argue with anyone about that later. Um, but what happened, though, was this patient progressed in the flare scale, and he actually went off study and eventually so this study kind of highlights the importance of looking at CNS penetration and really looking at it. Does it get an enhancing disease, get a non-enhancing disease? So now let's look at PARP inhibitors and kind of look at the spectrum. Uh, so across, there's about five or six PARP inhibitors that are out there that are being tested in patients or approved. Uh, and really, these are the two that are most important. We won't talk about proliferative because it's really a very, very weak PARP inhibitor. It doesn't have what we call PARP trapping, uh, and it does not work against IDH mutants for a variety of reasons. But these are the two drugs. This is a drug being made by Beijing. It's brand new. It's being used in clinical trials. It's a part trapper. It's CNS penetrant. And then Olaparib has CNS penetration with those caveats. Okay. I just put this slide in just so for the non-clinicians in the room, when we look at axial CT uh, MRI scans, we look at enhancing and non-enhancing disease. This is the flare uh, non-enhancing. This is the T1 post. And this is an area, for instance, a GBM uh, typically is enhancing, and we would expect Olaparib to work here. But we would expect a lab not to work in this sort of enhancing disease, which is more infiltrated within the brain. And that's exactly what we saw a patient do here. So uh, sort of moving along, when we look at all these drugs that are out there, these are the companies that have them. We sort of went around the block and kind of talked to all of them to try to get these drugs into patients with IDH mutant tumors. We consider these variables of just plain ball, uh, blood-brain barrier penetration, okay? And again, these really are the two that we care about, and potency. And again, we want to be on this end of the spectrum, not on blipper. I'm going to come back to blipper uh, at the very end. Uh, so it was really kind of like threading the needle. Uh, we were able to, working very closely uh, with Pat and Paul and, and other folks, uh, we were able to get a laparib uh, in a trial that will tell you about enhancing glenomas and extracranial tumors. 
Uh, and after a lot of work with uh, Baby, we were able to get them uh, to give us their drug to test it in the current IDFG uh, glioma's. So we're sort of now just going to go very quickly uh, through each one of these kind of uh, songs, uh, so I don't run out of time. Uh, so the first thing we did was as we began to move this in the clinic, we wanted to see how quickly we could get an efficacy signal to kind of serve as preliminary data and just to make us feel better about moving forward on this. Uh, Paul, as you know, has the LAPRO trial, which is looking at non-BRCA immunopaired affected tumors and looking for sensitivity to olaparib, uh, and uh, this is the schema shown here. Uh, and we were able to uh, amend his study, and he was gracious enough to work with us to treat SDH, FH, and ID treatment patients, okay? And I'll just show you one patient. Again, this is anecdotal, but we do have many coming out around the bend. Uh, this was in collaboration with Jeff Shapiro. This was an IDH mutant chondrosarcoma patient who was progressing with lung mass. And, and as some of you may or may not know, chondrosarcoma does not respond to PARP inhibitors, okay? This patient, the IDH mutation, within two cycles had a near 70% tumor reduction, had a sustained PR, which actually lasted 14 months just on monotherapy elaborate. So this was very encouraging. We have other patient responses that uh, are, are looking positive, and we hope to publish that soon. But with that sort of sound check, we kind of went on to our full show. Uh, and um, with that, I'll show you our first big trial that is really set to take off quite soon. So this is NCI 10129, uh, and this is the schema. We'll kind of go through this in just a moment. Uh, but this has really been exciting. It's been an opportunity to work with Pat, uh, who runs phase one here, and a variety of clinical uh, translational co uh, collaborators, including Avi, who will be speaking about some of the stuff he's doing in our trial uh, in uh, his, uh, his talk. Uh, so just to sort of highlight some features of this trial, just because of time, I don't want to go through everything. First thing I'll highlight is Team LaRusso rocks, okay? So Scott's in the audience and Diane and, and Jameson who have really made this trial possible. And you can see by the complexity of this trial that this is not easy. Uh, and I'm very thankful that they are uh, really essentially running the show here. So here's some salient features that will be relevant for today. Uh, so in the IDH mutant gliomas, I just told you that Olaparib only gets in the C1 post. So we have made an eligibility criteria that requires patients that have enhancing disease, okay? Um, in addition, I told you that we have strong feelings about the IDH inhibitors, and a lot of patients will have seen an IDH inhibitor, even though these drugs largely do not work, uh, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so what we've done is a stratification in each group uh, by IDH exposure status. And then we've been these out, as I mentioned earlier, mutant glioma, cholangiocarcinoma, and then other solid tumors. These two are independent Simon two stages that will run in parallel, and this is going to be descriptive statistics. Uh, and then finally, what we're very excited about this study is uh, a wealth of uh, correlative uh, studies that will be uh, that are being implemented, including baseline and on tumor uh, on treatment tumor biopsies. Again, to be studies to be run by this this group shown here. <clears throat> this trial hopefully will launch in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're crossing our fingers, and, and Pat will actually be presenting this in November if you're interested to hear more. <clears throat> so moving on to our second set. So now let's go from outside the brain, really now into the brain. Um, so this was a, a trial that we've been trying to get off the ground for about a year and a half, and we're finally uh, moving on it. So this is working with Beijing CNS permeable PARP trapping PARP inhibitors. <clears throat> so this is a phase one, two trial uh, that we'll be uh, conducting. But, and, and importantly, we'll be looking at combination of temozolomide and the PARP inhibitor VGB290. We really believe that there's a synergistic interaction for a variety of reasons. Again, we'll talk more about the, the lab data for that at the Rad Bio seminar. Uh, but we'll have the first, we'll have our standard dose finding portion to get our recommended phase two dose, okay? Uh, then we'll move on to our phase two portion with the combination. And we basically have three arms that we have broken this up to. We have an alkylator resistant recurrent grade two, three uh, uh, arm. We have a not alkylator resistant group, okay? And then exploratory arm for grade four GBMs that have IDH mutation. Some of you remember earlier, only about 5% of GBMs uh, have uh, those mutations. This was actually purely done because of a historical control issue. Because in a randomized phase two, without randomization, you need a historical control, and you actually have to break this up. Otherwise, um, you'll be misled by the exposure to alkylators and mutations. And finally, as I alluded to earlier, we need to understand we think BGB290 gets into the brain, but we don't know to what extent. Uh, so what we built in here is a phase zero portion. We'll be looking at enhancing and non-enhancing disease using protocols that our group and others here at Yale developed from our mebeferdil trial that were successful. We're very, very uh, grateful to the supporters, Patrick Wen, Skip, and Bert, who really helped us bring this uh, through the clinic. And we do anticipate in about four or five months, this is all approved, we just need to get through the NCI CTEP final round. Uh, so finally, for the encore, uh, and surprisingly, I'm going to be on time, um, I will tell you a little bit about our path within the clinic for, P, uh, in the clinic for pediatric cancers, okay? Uh, again, just to highlight sort of the collaborative nature of, of, of what we have here. Asher Marks, who's the head of pediatric neuroncology, he and I were actually sitting around our tumor board one day, and we said, well, we've got this great story for IDH mutants in part in adult glioma, 
and those tumors are, those patients are relatively young and they're 30 to 40 year old. Well, what about patients age 10 to 20, right? It's not just like you turn 30 and you vote and get an IDH mutation, right? There's gotta be a bell curve. So can you treat that uh, left side of the bell curve, right? Uh, so that's exactly what we did. We, we set out to design a trial to test that hypothesis clinically, okay? Uh, this is the trial design. I'm just showing a very brief version of it. And what's different from the previous trial is that we'd be obviously targeting patients under 18, but over 10 because of some PK pharmacokinetics issues. Uh, but we'll also be looking at newly diagnosed patients as well. Uh, and again, uh, doing, a, in this case, a standard 3 plus 3 design expansion cohort. We'll also be doing a phase zero in this trial as well. And just sort of for fun, I'll kind of tell you the backstory and kind of getting these trials off the ground. These are not easy because you're constantly trying to find the right company and the right cooperative group that'll help you run the study. And just an example, like a two second vignette here, um, we pitched this to the first pediatric cooperative group, and like literally, that's like all we got. Like we got like they like never texted us back. Uh, and then and then we pitched to the second cooperative group, and they, they actually blocked us by analogy. And when I say blocked us, they actually decided to compete with us with Deliberate. We said go fine, it doesn't work in IDH mutant tumors. Good luck. Uh, and so they are moving forward with that. Uh, but we did find a group which is Kenoc. This is a fabulous group. So many of you know Sabine Miller and Mike Prados who started a foundation funded, there's no government support, so they moved literally at the speed of light. This trial will actually open three times faster than any of our NCI-related trials, just because they don't have sort of uh, some of the uh, delays that are inherent to that uh, path. So the question is, I alluded to this earlier, you know, um, how will we accrue to the study, right? If pediatric IDH mutant age 10 to 18, that's like not a very common group, about 20% of a rare cancer, right? So PNOC has established quite an infrastructure. All 19 of the major sites, and then Yale will be a guest site, and hopefully a member of PNOC because of this trial, uh, finally, uh, will be open in the study. We'll possibly open in this in the UK as well as of an update from a couple of weeks ago. In parallel, we also worked with Who Teen Cancer America. This is Roger Daltrey's group, which is actually focused on this group of uh, adolescent and young adult cancers, which are actually often underserved because they're stuck in between COG trials, which are zero to 10, and adult trials, which are 18 uh, and over, okay? And just to sort of let, wrap up in the last few minutes here, I'll just tell you about the, the cor correlatives in these trials. So we're very excited about these. Um, it's very similar hypotheses uh, uh, for both trials, which is we really think there's gonna be molecular features within IDH mutants uh, that are gonna be sensitive. And so to this end, we'll be looking at whole exome sequencing, <laughs> looking at RNA-seq. We'll be looking at methylation profiling. Some of you know IDH mutants induce a SIMP uh, type of phenotype. And we'll be looking at ultimate metabolite profiling. And again, we'll be doing phase zero uh, components in both of those trials. We've assembled a team of collaborators to, to do this. Um, we're very excited about it. And really what we've recently established within our department uh, in therapeutic radiology is this, this uh, mini core that we're just calling Brainstorm, which is gonna funnel all of the correlatives from our specific cooperative group trials and, and distribute them to all of our collaborators. And again, you'll hear more about this in early October, uh, where we're very excited to have been funded by a million dollar pure search grant to start this and to really get the, uh, get the wheels turning. <clears throat> so with that, I'll just sort of end with, you know, I've shown you a little flavor of kind of what we're doing, what's about to sort of take off. We have a lot more on the horizon. We do believe that combinations of radiation temidar and BGB-290 for recurrent IDH mutant gliomas will be uh, quite interesting. So we're working with Dinesh Mehta very closely uh, to get that off the ground. So uh, we're also looking on the AML front, about 20% of IDH, uh, AMLs have IDH1, IDH2 mutations. And we're very interested looking at Tomas Corbe and uh, uh, Namrata and our laboratory, looking at uh, whether we can use monotherapy or lapper there. Uh, and eventually we'd like to add immunotherapy, which you know, everyone has to add immunotherapy, but there's actually a reason that I can tell you about more uh, later for IDH mutants that's very important. Um, and so with that, I'll just sort of conclude with really one, one slide that we've really come a long way in the glioma world. Uh, we've come from a time when we're looking at CT scans to MRI, we're looking at, you know, uh, rosettes under the H&E stain, and now we have these each molecular subtypes within each glioma, and even within each subtype, and I apologize, it's small, this is IDH mean, we have sub, we have a subtypes within those subtypes, okay? And we would make the argument that that is a treasure trove of genetic biomarkers that we can use to exploit for tumor targeting for therapeutic gain, okay? Uh, people have asked me sort of what is the next trial because obviously, you know, we don't know if these trials I just showed you are gonna work. We think it's just the beginning. Uh, this is an example of how we're starting to think we want others to think as well. If you have a decent <laughs> high mutant IDH glioma, uh, we'd love to see a trial where we resect the radiation temidar ATR inhibitor followed by adjuvant temidar PARP inhibitor, maybe followed by immunotherapy, right? Um, but just for folks in the room to think about, these are the types of things we're going to have to think about if we want to get these trials off the ground, OK? 
that what I show you hopefully today is a start. Um, so with that, I will finish on time. I'll thank all the folks in my laboratory uh, uh, for their help, all of our collaborators, uh, especially uh, the team, uh, 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 Pat, Pat's group, uh, uh, and, and some of the other folks I mentioned earlier. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention all the folks that have funded our research. It wouldn't be possible without any of those, those folks as well. So with that, in the last two minutes, I'll take questions. <clears throat> Yes, uh, so that's exactly what uh, Avi Patel to your right. Yeah, yeah, he, he will be doing that. Uh, in the CNS, it's not clear if we can detect it. Uh, although someone was telling me that uh, Johan de Bono said that they could do it in the peripheral blood, but it sounds sketchy. But, um, but yeah, so we will be doing that, actually. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yet, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think it's a mix of things. I, as you know, there's sort of a je ne sais quoi about what is CNS penetrant, what isn't. And I think that there's really, you know, why is BGP-290 so much more CNS penetrant than Vilipra? If you look at the structures, it's hard. Uh, so I don't think I could give you a good answer today. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, very good. Thank you.